We are starting a brand new series called On Guard. So why don't you guys grab a Bible or device and turn to Ephesians chapter 6, which is going to be the section we're going to be looking at for eight weeks. So man, you, by the time we're done with uh, this, this section of scripture, you might even have it memorized, which would be pretty awesome. So Ephesians chapter 6, and uh, I use the Version Bible app, and that's also where you guys can, if you want to take notes, there's a whole section that we have our, our, our link to that, and you can take notes in there if you want to do that. Um, just awesome. Uh, hey, did Pastor Jeff do a great job last week or what? Uh, I, I got to watch that online and I was just, I, our whole preaching, uh, teaching staff is just so good. Um, but, uh, but if you'd missed it, it was just good. I, I want to encourage you to, to, to look at it because it was, it was, it's time to focus on eternity and to look at the things that are yet to come. And so it's pretty good. Uh, but today we're not going to be focusing on eternity, but we are going to focus on the eternal things. And we're going to be looking at the unseen things that are in the spiritual realm. And so uh, Ephesians chapter six is just a, a great section of scripture, but we're really going to look at this unseen battle that's, that's around us. So the, t- 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 the title of this series is called On Guard. There's a spiritual battle going on out there, and it's a spiritual battle going on for our own hearts. It's going on for people that we know, our kids, our parents, uh, p- our friendships. There is a spiritual battle that's going on around us. And so today we're going to look at uh, the unseen uh, realm a little bit closer. So before we get to that, I, I want to bring up a section of scripture. It, it's, uh, it's so fascinating. And, and maybe you might want to look at the whole thing, but it's in 2 Kings. It's in the Old Testament. And there's this prophet named Elisha. And Elisha is his prophet, prophet, but he would often say prophecies uh, from God about the culture that was around him. And there was this one king, the king of Aram, who was so angry at this prophet that he actually got his army together to surround a city in order to take down this one prophet of God. He was so mad at this prophet of God, he gets a whole army to try to take him down. And then his servant wakes up in the middle of the morning and, uh, or in the morning, and he sees this vast array of this army and he begins to panic. Well, instead of me just telling you the story, let's actually read it. And it's going to be up on the screen, 2 Kings chapter 6. It said, when the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh no, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Now let me stop there. What what does it mean? There's only two of them. How is there more that are with us than there are with them? Well, it goes on. Then Elisha prayed, open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and he saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. So who is that? Well, that's the angelic forces that, that are in this battle. And so why Elisha was not nervous about that army is because he knew who was for him. And, 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 and that there, there, was, there was this the angelic forces of, uh, of these, these chariots of fire that were all around him. And if you kept reading on, you'd find out that all of a sudden the vast army of, of the king of Aram, uh, they all end up attacking each other and they lose and all these different things happen. What my goal is today is in this series for eight weeks, we're going to be going through this, is for us to learn to see the unseen. I I mean, I know that's kind of hard to see the unseen, but my prayer has been that we would open our eyes, that we would see. We might not be able to see the unseen realm, but we can see the ramifications of it. And when we begin to look and see what's going around in our culture, in our life, in our marriages, and all these different things, there is a battle going on. And, and what my prayer is, is that we're going to be able to see this unseen realm. So if you're in Ephesians chapter 6, we're going to start with verse 10. And I'm actually going to read all the way through verse 20, even though we're only going to focus on the first two sections. But I want us to read the whole entirety of what we're going to be looking at over these next eight weeks. So here we go. Chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord. So if you've never read the book of Ephesians... Uh, it's six chapters. It is so good. 
It, it is one of my favorite books in the Bible, but it culminates with this last part, and that's why he says, finally, because he's saying, hey, after I told you all these things, now I want you to be on guard. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything, to stand. So stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given to me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. That's the word of God. Good stuff, right? Yeah, and we're going to break that down over these next eight weeks. But we're going to focus on that first part. But before we go any further, uh, again, our series is called On Guard. There's a spiritual battle out there. And today is seeing the unseen. Let's pray. Lord, that's our prayer, that we would better understand what's going on around us. We know there's angels, we know there's demons, and we know there's a battle for people's souls, and there's a battle for even our hearts and our minds, and there's a battle always around us. And so we pray that we would be able to see that which is going on and better understand how to defend ourselves from the devil's schemes. And so, Lord, we lift up each other, even right now, that we could hear your word and not just hear it, but put it into our hearts. And so we give you thanks, and we ask all of this in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Okay, I told you our focus is going to be on the first two uh, verses or three verses. So let's look at uh, verse 10 and uh, let's read this again. Chapter 6, verse 10 through 12. And this is what we're going to focus on today. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Whose mighty power? His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Whose schemes? The devil, the de right. First service said that much louder than you guys did. Yeah, there was a contest. I didn't know if you knew this. Uh, so who schemes? <laughs> there we go. For our struggle, here it is. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of the evil in the heavenly realms. Okay. So if you like to take notes, uh, uh, I encourage you to do that. But we're going to break this down and have some certain things that we're going to look at. And the first one is this. The battle is unavoidable. Let me say that again. There's a battle going on out there. And you might want to ignore it. You might want to think it's not happening. You might not want it to happen. But I'm here to tell you it is unavoidable. It is happening. There is a battle out there. And it is unavo avo unavoidable. That's a hard word to say. Wow. Speaking of a battle, I mean, sometimes it's a battle for me just to speak. And this is what I do for a living. That's, what, that's scary. Scary. You know, there, there's a battle whether you like it or not. And you may not want to believe it, but it's there. It's for our households. It's, 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 it, there's a battle in our marriages. But, it, but it, what we heard right there is it's not against flesh and blood. You know, you may, you may think your wife is your enemy. You might think your, your teenage kid is your enemy at the time. You might think your parents are blocking everything in your life. But the battle is not against, is not flesh and blood. It is a spiritual battle that's out there. And it is unavoidable. I said it perfect that time. That's really good. You know, um, uh, the Apostle Paul is writing to a, a group of people called the Ephesians. They lived in a, in a place called Ephesus. Now, the typical first century of Ephes, Ephesonian, an Ephesian, you would not have to convince that there was a spiritual battle out there. They already saw it. They already believed in it. First century uh, people back then, 
They saw it all around them. They would get witch doctors. They would get magicians. They, they would have tikis and, 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 and uh, idols and things to try to, to try to stop these spiritual battles. You would not have to convince them that there's a spiritual battle. Just like many cultures in the world today. You know, if you go to Vietnam or you go to places in Africa, you go there. Man, they see the spiritual battle all the time. Uh, I, I mean, and I'm going to share stories as, as we go along, but, but there is weird stuff that happens that there's no way around it. It's a, it's a demonic realm out there. But what Satan wants to do to our culture is he wants to convince us that there is not a battle, that there are uh, demons. That's pasha, right? And so it's funny, it different, he has different schemes that he uses, but I'm here to tell you that it's unavoidable. And so here's something if, if, uh, that I think is pretty cool. But today, when we think about Satan and the spiritual battle, there's really, uh, we make one of two mistakes. The first mistake that we can make is that we can overestimate Satan's power and impact in our lives. So we can overestimate it, you know? And I'm going to try to be careful during this series, even though we're focusing on this stuff, to realize that we have the power within us. Satan, Satan cannot take our salvation away. He cannot take us down in that sense. But he can, he can sometimes convince us that he doesn't exist, or he can use other things. But a lot of times, some people can overestimate what he, his power that he can do. And they sometimes attribute things that only God can really do. I mean, I've known people that say, you can't speak that because if Satan hears that, he's going to, you know, use it. I don't know. We can sometimes overestimate what Satan can do. But I think the, the reverse is also true. We can, we can underestimate Satan's power and his capabilities and his impact in our lives. And I think that's a scarier one. I think the one that's scarier is when we underestimate what's going on around us. When, when we focus on what we can see and not realize that there's an unseen world that's trying to take us down. And there's a battle going on. The angelic forces and the demonic forces. And, and, and we're, we're involved in that. And we're a part of all of that. But you know, another mistake that we can make is that we don't even realize that there's a battle at all. We just don't even realize it. And, and that can really be a big mistake. So the battle is unavoidable. It's happening whether you like it or not. Whether you want to believe in it or not. Uh, it's unavoidable. But, but a second thing is this, is that the enemy is invisible. Now, that, that's not something I really need to convince you. You kind of see that. But he, he might be invisible, but we can see the outcomes. He might be invisible, but we can see the actions and the, and the reactions that, that, that come from, from that. Yes, he's invisible, and we need to realize that. And, and again, when I say Satan, uh, or I use the word enemy, it, it really usually is not, Satan is not on your shoulder, it, 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 but there are demons. And we know that scripturally, and, and you, we can answer why, how did God allow all this stuff to happen? But he did, because he, he wants us with our free will to be able to be involved in the things that are going on around us. So let's look at Ephesians six twelve again. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Now understand this. Because of my position in Christ, because Christ dwells within me in my position in Christ, I am now a child of the Most High God. Satan wants to take me down. Because of your position in Christ... If you're a believer, I know not everybody's a believer here today, but, but, but if you're a believer, and because of your position in Christ, Satan wants to take you down. See, the unbelieving world, Satan's already got, he's already got him. I mean, he's like, I'm not going to mess with that guy. I'm just going to keep making him think that there's no God. That, that, that's my goal. I, whatever, I'm going to, you know, whatever. But for us, because of our position in Christ, he, he does come at us. So we have to figure out how to fight this good fight. And that's, again, what we're going to be looking at over these next couple you know, weeks, really eight weeks altogether, is what is these armor of God? Because Paul didn't just make this stuff up. He didn't just flippantly put some armor here and there. These are really good things that we're going to learn a lot over these next couple weeks. You know, uh, I, I've shared openly, you know, maybe uh, 10, 12, 13 years ago, mine and Melissa's marriage was not good. We're not doing well. We would never have gotten a divorce, but we, could, we, could, we would both say we can see why people 
get divorced. We just, there was a lot of conflict in our household at that time. We had teenagers. Uh, Melissa and my, my daughter were at each other a lot, a lot of times. And, 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 and it just was difficult. I wanted out of ministry. I wanted out of my marriage. I wanted out of life. I was just depressed. And I know some of you have been there and done that. You know, you can see it just gets depressing and, and things. And, 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 and I was blaming Melissa for a lot of things. And, and I've shared this. This isn't true of everybody, but it's, it's pretty true. Men withdraw. Women attack. And men would draw into anything. Pornography, affairs, uh, uh, TV, you know, games, whatever. But men would draw, women attack. And that's exactly what was going on in our household. And I was withdrawing. And I would, would just, I just, I, I just wasn't a good husband. I wasn't a good dad. I just, and when I finally came to the conclusion that I wanted to take back my life, when I finally came to the conclusion that I needed to, that, that, that instead of blaming Melissa and being mad at her and going, she's the problem, I had to realize that there was a spiritual battle. And it wasn't until I started really getting on my knees and saying, Lord, fix me. And praying for my wife. And, and really getting on my knees and realizing that my battle was not against flesh and blood. The battle was in the spiritual realm. And it wasn't until then that things started to completely change. And now we would say, and we share all the time, I can't believe there could be a better marriage than what we have right now. And see, I realized that battle is not against flesh and blood. It's not against Melissa. If there's something else going on out there, and I needed to get more involved on my knees. I need to get more involved in prayer and praying for my wife and praying for my family and praying for my daughter. I was trying to use brain power when I needed to use spiritual power. And so here's the thing. Though our enemy is invisible, that does not make him fictional. And I think we get confused there. And we can think since we don't really see it all, but do we see the outcomes? Can we see the consequences? Yeah, look around. So that battle in your marriage, that battle with your kid, that battle with your parents, that battle with your boss, battle, it's not against, there, there's something else going on and you need to get involved and you need to be aware and you need to put on the full armor of God, which is what we're gonna be looking at over the next couple of weeks. So the other thing is this, our enemy, our enemy has a plan. The question is, do you? Okay, our enemy has a plan. He's been at this for thousands of years. He has a plan and he knows you. He's known you since you were born. He's like, <laughs> and he has a plan. And so the thing needs to be, do you? Do you have a plan? Because he has one. You know, uh, I, I grew up in a small mountain town in Southern California and uh, uh, in, in, in an area called Lake Gregory. And we, we were just two blocks off this lake and I just walked there and, and you could paddle boat, big old lake. Um, uh, they rented out rowboats. And, and my dad was an avid fisherman. I wasn't really big into fishing for two reasons. One, I don't really like fish, you know, to eat it. So why catch them and just go, you know, okay, I'm not gonna eat this thing. The second reason is this getting up at five o'clock in the morning is for the birds. And I just can't, you know, when you're 11 years old and you're thinking, and I'm like, dad's saying, yeah, we're going to go fishing. We're going to wake up at four in the morning or whatever. And, I, and then I get anxiety the night before and I can't get to sleep. And so I didn't fall asleep till two and I'm, and I'm on the boat. You know, and, and, and just thinking about it makes me, okay. Anyway, so, but every 4th of July, my small town, I mean, just a couple thousand people would have uh, all this 4th of July festivities. Great fireworks show over the lake. Um, they have parades, you know. Like here, we only have a parade when, when the Nuggets win the championship. But, but, but my town, you know, it'd be like the fire department. And then there'd be clowns going down the street. And then they had to throw out candy. And it was just fun. But they also, every year, had a fishing derby where age, age levels could win a trophy if you caught the biggest fish, you know, for your age. So at 11 years old, my dad and I went out on a boat and we go fishing. And I, he made sure I had to do everything on my own. So if I won, I could be, you know, good. I didn't cheat. And so I wanted to catch a catfish. Now, a catfish is kind of a bottom dweller. And, and so you have to use different things than you would use to catch trout. And so, so I go, I'm going to use a lure. 
And my dad said, I would use a worm. And I said, hmm, worms are squirmy and putting them on the hook is kind of, that's mean. <laughs> and so I go, I, I'm going to use a lure. And he goes, okay, all right, okay. So I put a lure on there and you drop it down and it's on the bottom. And, and you, you hope this little catfish is, is going get to that, get that lure. Two hours I just sat there on this boat falling asleep and caught nothing. And finally I said, because I wanted to win this contest, I said, okay, dad, I'll, I'll use a worm. He goes, smart, which is, might be the only time he called me smart. But, <laughs> but uh, uh, so I took the lure off. I put, put a hook on and I took this big old long, you know, worm. And the reason why a worm's good because a worm moves around. So this little blind, you know, a catfish are kind of blind. And so they, they, they hear somehow the little worm and they feel it and then they grab it. Sure enough, it wasn't 15 minutes that I dropped that worm down. All of a sudden, boom, I get this, I get this catfish and it's 13 inches long, two pounds. And at 11 years old, I won the fishing derby championship of Lake Gregory. Thank you. Thank you. There's only a couple of things I'm proud of in my life, and that's one of them. Uh, so so I, I won the fishing tournament. Change of bait changed everything. Guess what? Satan knows what bait works for you. Satan knows which bait for you. And it might be different than what bait he would use for you. And it might be very different than what bait he's going to use for you. You know, he's going to use different bait for guys than he does for girls. He's going to use different baits for certain areas and regions. And you see this, different sections of the United States, different cultures in the world. Some cultures, he reveals himself that he's, he, he's the devil and, and, and they're afraid to go places. And he u- utilizes witch doctors and, and trances and bizarre stuff. And in other places like us, he tries to make sure we're not there, but he still uses a bait. And so what is it that he uses for bait to catch you? It's going to be based on what your sin patterns are, or it's going to be based on certain things that are going on in your life. So what is your issue? Lust? Bitterness? Anger? Because he's going to use a different type of bait to catch you based on what, it's, what would catch you. Is it, is it your pride? Is it workaholism? What's he going to use for a bait? Because it's different for you than it is going to be for me. What is it? Because a change of bait changes everything. So what is he using for you? If you have struggles in, in, in depression, he's going to use something different. Loneliness is going to cause something else. What is it? What is it? You know, here, here's an example. So, so get this. So a, a study came out the other day. And in Southern California, okay, a different region than us, even though we're starting to look a little bit more like it. But Southern California, 50%, now you heard that 5-0, 50% of all millennials and younger, 50% have some sort of gender dysphoria. Okay, in case you don't know what that means, that means trying to figure out, am I a boy, am I a girl, you know, uh, dealing with some type of sexual issue, 50%. Now, that's not at all a percentage that's anywhere else in the United States. You go to Georgia, there's not even close to that. Michigan, not even that. Colorado doesn't even have that, even though we're catching up. And in places in Europe, not at all. Or even the generation before them. The generation right before them is only a quarter of percent. A quarter of a percent has gender dysphoria. But millennials on down, 50%. What's going on? I'll tell you what's going on. Satan is duping a whole de- generation. And that's just one example. So it's regional. It's a weird thing how he works. What he's going to do in Africa is totally different than what he's going to do here. What, what he's going to do in, 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 in certain areas, you can go inner city. He's going to deal with gang people a different way and cause different types of conflicts within them than he will in a suburban neighborhood. He can use wealth, he can use knowledge, he can use all kinds of things to catch us. So what's the bait? A whole generation is sitting around thinking they are a mistake. And it kills me. And there's a lot of young people in here that think they're a mistake. You think you're a mistake. And that's a lie from the pit. 
You're not a mistake. You know, so many people, who, I know not everybody's finished puberty yet. I barely have. But, but, but puberty is a strange time, always has been. And then to get a whole system of people and people driving into them that you're a mistake is sickening. So what's the bait for you? Because the battle is unavoidable. And our enemy is invisible, even though we can see the outcomes and we can see, you know, the results. But I'm also here to tell you, he has a plan. And the question is, do you? You know, there's this book called um, This Present Darkness. I don't know, has any, anybody read This Present Darkness? I mean, great book. It's a novel, and, but it'll scare the living daylights out of you. And, and the first couple chapters are just okay, but man, once you get going, and what it is, is why I'm bringing it up, is because he does such a good job, Frank Peretti, of, of revealing the spiritual realm, showing us the angelic forces, the demonic forces, and then how our actions and reactions here on earth change and make a difference. And so there's battles, scenes, and, and, and angels with swords, and, and demons, and they're flying around. And there's some really interesting sections where people are, you know, you see like maybe some of the characters in there are losing. And it isn't until they get on their knees in prayer, or somebody prays for them, that all of a sudden God is able to unleash some of the angelic forces, and they get more power based on our prayer. Now, again, it's a novel. But it's based on truth. See, we're in a battle. And we have to fight. And I'm here to tell you this. What are you doing? Because Satan has a plan. Do you? Are you in prayer? Are you going to church consistently? Because that's part of fighting the battle. Are you in a life group or Bible study? Something. Are you reading God's word? Because that's part of the battle. What are you doing? I want to challenge you to be here as much as possible over these next eight weeks because I think it's that important because we have an enemy that's after us and he has a plan. What's yours? What's your plan for your marriage? What's your plan for your relationships? What's your plan? The fourth one is this, is, and, and you already might know this, but our weapons are not physical. Our weapons are not physical. We can't sit around and get out a knife and start fighting Satan. It's not going to work. So our weapons are not. They're spiritual. You know? And, 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 and so we're going to be looking over these next eight weeks at each of these things. We're going to look at the helmet of salvation. We're going to look at the, the belt of truth. We're going to look at the breastplate of righteousness. And what do these mean? And how do they work? You know, uh, I uh, play soccer every Saturday with our, our soccer, our sports ministry. Yeah, and uh, you can join us. We, we play over here at Front Range Christian on the field uh, uh, every Saturday at 12 o'clock, and it's co-ed, so you can come and try to beat me. You can't, but you can try. Uh, but, but here's the thing, is uh, afterwards, some of the, the people say, hey, what are you pre preaching? What's the new series? And I said, you know, I told him what it's about, spiritual warfare. And one of our young men, Topher, who's sitting right here, he goes, he goes what's, your, what's your favorite armor of God, Bruce? And I said, I never thought about having a favorite armor of God. He goes, well, mine's the belt of truth. And I go, why? And he goes, because everything else hinges on the belt of truth. And then, the, then a quick little discussion went around about how if we don't live our lives based on truth, then everything else doesn't make sense. So next week, we're, that's our first one, is the belt of truth. Everything hinges on that. I don't want to give things away, but it's all about truth. And the truth is what sets us free. And truth is a person, Jesus Christ. True? True. Amen. So look at this. Because of my relationship to Christ, I am connected to more power and strength than what is coming against me from Satan. Let me say that again. Because of my relationship with Christ, I am connected to more power and strength than what is coming against me from Satan. The qu question every believer should ask is, am I connected? So did, did you catch? I said, every believer. So I realized if you're not a believer, you're certainly not connected. And you're just, free for all is happening. But as believers, we need to realize, are we connected? Because I, I, I'll be honest, I can sometimes in my spiritual walk be disconnected. I've had seasons where I'm definitely not connected. 
and you know, and, and, and I'm up here preaching, but I'm not preaching spirit-filled because I'm not connected or whatever. And I know if that's true with me, that's gotta also be true with you. They're just seasons that we go through that we just, ah. So the question is, because we have more power at our fingertips, more power in our heart, more, more capabilities because of our, our relationship to Jesus Christ. But the question is, are you connected? And so my prayer as we're gonna close right here is we know the battle is unavoidable. We know it's real as real can be. We see its ramifications all around us, even in your life, your marriage, your, your family, your friendships. The question needs to be, he's got a plan, do you? And our weapons are not physical, it's spiritual. And so we need to be battle ready. We need to, to be on guard. And so my prayer for us as a people, as a church, is to be connected. So let's pray that right now. And let's close. And if you have not asked Christ in your life, I'd like to give you an opportunity to receive him today. I'm not going to call you forward. I'm just going to ask you to lift up your hand, and I'm going to lead you in a prayer. Uh, simple. But, but let's, let's pray today, right now, all of us. Heavenly Father, thank you that you don't leave us alone, that there's more power at our fingertips, more power in our heart, more power in our life than anything that can be thrown at us. But sometimes we're, we're just gonna be honest, we're disconnected. And I'm gonna say in this room right now, some of us are just disconnected. So Lord, would, would you strengthen us, empower us, give us, I mean, we're learning now that we have hope, but let's, we pray that we could take that hope and come up with a plan of action to fight this good fight and to win this race and to take on what's going on around us, that our battle is not against the people but against the spiritual realm. Now our heads are bowed. If you haven't received Jesus and you'd like to do that, I want to give you an opportunity to do that right now. So if you could do that, could you just lift up your hand real quick so I can see it? Just lift it up and I want to, I want to lead you in a prayer. Say, today is my day. I want to receive Jesus as Savior. I'm going to pray this prayer in case you're afraid to lift up your hand. And, and also we have people online that pray this all the time. So just pray this out for me in your heart. Jesus, come into my life. I ask you as my Lord and Savior. Thank you for dying on the cross for me and my sins. I now want to live for you. So I give you my life because you first gave me yours. I ask this in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen, amen, amen.